Welcome to I Rise Conversations with Joan. Welcome to I Rise Conversations with Joan. My name is Joan Wosu, and I'm the award-winning author of the book, I Rise, The 10 Secrets to Getting Up When Life Knocks You Down. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Writing a book, at least for me, is one of the many ways that people choose to share their message with the world. I believe that books change lives. It's as simple as that. Mm-hmm. I be- I also believe that there's a book inside of everyone, regardless of the genre, regardless of the reason why. And maybe today it might be time for you to write your own book. The stories of overcoming adversity and finding light in total darkness is a source of hope to many people. But a lot of people are so scared, they're so unsure, they don't want to be open, they don't want to be vulnerable to share the truth with the world. The truth is the world is waiting for your story. Mm-hmm. And then the excuses come, but Joan, I can't write. I don't have a publisher. I don't have time. Well, 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 <laughs> today we're going to demystify some of those excuses and get you to get writing on your book to tell your amazing story today. Today, we're going to be exploring overcoming adversity and getting that book published. Our guest today is Pasha Mistake Steele. She was born and raised in Pittsburgh in the US. She now lives in Nigeria with her husband, whom she secretly dated online. She's the CEO of Mystic Rose Publishing, where they help independent authors and aspiring writers through every step of the self-publishing process. Welcome, Pasha, to the show. Thank you, Joan. Very happy to be here. (laughs) I think probably like uh, me and everybody else listening, they're like, you dated him secretly and ended up moving to Nigeria. Tell us about that. Oh, girl, let me tell you. Here's what happened. No, okay. So um, (laughs) I, full transparency, okay? So I I grew up in a pretty strict household, Um. Some would say oppressive. So we were strongly discouraged from going out, being online, going to college, having a job. So I wasn't really allowed to do any of those things. So I was just at home all the time. And any access to the internet was monitored. So, you know, having a boyfriend was definitely out of the question. Now, keep in mind, I'm talking about my 20s, so not even my teens. So I am an adult as this is happening. Um, So, you know, when you want what you want bad, you find a way. (laughs) Where there's a will, there's a way. Come on. (laughs) Exactly. No, but what happened was I, I was really spiraling. Um, I don't like to call it depression, but I was really spiraling to a point where I felt I was n- really not in control of my life, not in control of my emotions, and I'm, life was dismal. And I, in order to survive, I had to assimilate and pretend like everything was okay. That's how you survive in that household. And I just didn't know how to take it anymore. So I was like, I need to do something with my time. So I secretly went online and I signed up for a language exchange site because I grew up learning German and I lost it in my early adult years. So I wanted to get back into it, you know? So I met up with this German woman and she was helping me and she was teaching me, but then guys were sliding into my DMs and I'm like, this is enough, okay? (laughs) So I need to get out of here. So the day that I was gonna delete my account, I checked my inbox and there is like an essay of somebody analyzing my profile information. And I was like, excuse me, who are you to be analyzing my, but you know, he said what he liked, what he didn't like, what he agreed with, disagreed with. And I was like, dang. I was like, listen, I'm deleting my account, but here's my email. If you want to talk, let's talk. The next day he emailed me and thus began our five-year dating experience. Five years? five years and no one knew and I was still spiraling out of control I was still not doing okay Mm -hmm. and so um a a major altercation happened uh, in my household and my sister was like we have to go so I said okay fine let's just go we literally packed our things in the middle of the night and left at like 3 a.m in the morning it was terrible it was crazy it was scary but we that was the only way because you know the head of the household would have you to believe that, oh, if you want anything, you tell me, I'll get it for you. That's not the case. Mm. You really couldn't get what you wanted out of life if you wanted it for yourself. 
-hmm. Now, as long as it benefited everybody else, then you can have it. Mm -hmm. But that's not how life should work. So we snuck out. Three months later, I hop on a plane to see the guy. <laughs> and I was like, you know, let's see if we vibe. So I was going to just stay in Nigeria for 30 days and then come back home. That was the plan. But the day I arrived, he proposed to me. No way. Yes. <laughs> I said yes. Three months later, we got married and we're still happily married in Enugu, Nigeria. <laughs> Okay, so for people who don't know where Enugu is, that's in the southeastern part of Nigeria. That's not where most people who go back to Nigeria or move to Nigeria typically move to. So this was like a complete shift for you. Definitely a different culture, a different environment. But look at that love story. That's a book. <laughs> I'm telling you now, that is a book because a lot of people have lost hope in in this thing called love and finding the par right partner and all that. But through mm. all of your adversity, you met the man of your dreams. I did. I really did. <laughs> Amazing. So I know you touched on kind of overcoming adversity and some yeah. of that you had to go through. What were some of your darkest moments like? Because I feel like everybody goes through really dark moments in their lives. What was your lowest of your low? The lowest of my low, I think, you know, it's funny, and I can remember the literally the exact moment. So, um, so what was happening in, in that situation was um, sexual abuse, but I didn't recognize it as that because I was made to believe that it was okay and that this should be happening and all that other stuff. And so that's how I was living my life, thinking that this was okay, even though I didn't want this to be happening. It was bringing me down. It was hurting me physically and mentally. Like it was really hurtful, but I'm, I'm getting beat over the head with, this is okay. This is what's supposed to be happening. This is all right. You have nothing to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. And so I think the lowest moment I remember I, I walked into the bathroom and I was staring at myself in the mirror after something had happened. And we don't need to, to get into explicit detail, but yeah. something happened. And I walked into the bathroom and I'm looking at myself in the mirror and I was finally saw that I was emaciated, like malnourished. I don't know. I was eating. It's not like we didn't have food. I was eating, yeah. but my eyes were dark and gaunt and my, my skin was pale and I was really skinny. And I'm like, who is this woman? Who is this? And, and I remember thinking, are you going to be here forever? How are you going to leave? You tried to leave before. And when you tried, look what happened. It completely backfired three times before. Did you try to leave? And it completely backfired. Anytime you spoke up, not that I physically tried, but I spoke mm -hmm. up and it's just like, it, it didn't work. So I'm like, what are you going to do? You're going to die here? Maybe, you know, so you start, I start to get in my head. It's like, oh, is that what we're talking about right now? Is this where we're going? And then I was like, you know what? Let me just pray. And that was the lowest moment because that was the moment where God gave me one word, only one word, and it was endure, which was the worst word I wanted to hear. I was so furious, like, oh, that's it, that's it, endure, have I not been doing that this whole time? You know, I've been pretending, I've been assimilating, I've been enduring, but it just endure endure over and over and over again when I would wake up when I would go to sleep when I'm in the shower I would just hear that word over and over so okay no problem <laughs> let me endure let me continue and lo and behold wow oh, wow I can't even imagine what you went through like it sounds like it was really a traumatic experience for you and Again, like I said, a lot of people, most people go through some form of adversity in life and some people are able to overcome and just get on with their lives, but some people are not able to, and they stay stuck in that cycle of trauma and they're just never able to break free. For you, mm -hmm. what would you say, it was, what was that thing that you did that helped you to put all of this behind and just move on with your life? took a lot. It was not just one thing. Um, so prayer was first and foremost, because 
the, when me and my sister left, we only left because God said that I could. So I know for people who were like, ah, you know, listen, I know it might sound crazy to some, but I never do anything without asking God first. And then I get confirmation. And if I get that confirmation, then I'm allowed to do it. If God says no, then I won't. Mm -hmm. So there was, I was actually fasting before we left just to make sure I, you know, this is what we're supposed to do. Like we had nowhere to go. We didn't have a house. We didn't have anything. I mean, we had money because while I was secretly dating the guy, I was also secretly working as an editor oh online. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> the, book. the secret life of book. book. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, God. I had a nice little nest egg of several thousand. So we were able to, you know, do some things with it. Um, But once I came to Nigeria, I really thought, oof, it's over. Hmm. No. Um, my husband is absolutely incredible. He's amazing. But those... That trauma doesn't just go away because you're in a blissful marriage or in a happy situation. That issue is still there. So from trying to get right, talking to my husband, him coaching me through it, me praying, it wasn't enough. I was still having nightmares. Almost every night I would have a nightmare. And it was difficult. And the thing that got me out of it was actually writing my story. I didn't publish it. I wrote it. So writing my story, sharing my story, telling people about it. And then the, the icing on the cake was that I took Landmark Forum. I don't know if you know it, but Landmark is a amazing program. They have all of these seminars. And in it, it really helps you clear the fog of everything. It is not for the pain of heart. It's really difficult. But one of the things that they had me do was call my father. Now, I hadn't spoken to him since I left. Yeah. And I was shaking. Joan, I can't tell you. I, I man, my hand was shaking. I was like, I can't. And they were like, that's the only way. The only way to clear yourself in life and, and move forward is to call him. So I took a deep breath. Felt like I was going to vomit, but I did. <laughs> Called him up. And hearing his voice, you know, got my heart going. I'm like, I feel like I'm a little kid again. Mm. And, and I'm on the phone with him. And I just tell him everything that happened. And I, I don't know why, but it's just like, I want you to know that this actually did happen. And I know you want to pretend like it, it was okay, but I want to let you know that it was not okay for me. And, you know, let me just, I just had to like, you know, I started laying out. So this happened and you remember that? And do you remember this? And do you remember that? And do you remember this? And do you remember that? <laughs> And, and really, it was all about me being authentic. All yeah. the things that I've never said, I finally said. I just wanted to be my authentic self. I didn't want to bite my tongue. I didn't want to hold back my words. I just want to let it all out. And so I did. And at the end of the phone call, some things he was like, oh, that never happened. No, I think you're making that up. I'm pretty sure that's fabricated. I'm like, listen, that's fine. Your response was actually irrelevant. You could have been like, man, 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 the whole time I was on the phone and it wouldn't have made a difference. Mm -hmm. All I had to do was get it out. So we said our goodbyes, said we're probably never going to see each other again. And I'm like, I'm okay with that. You know, if you're okay with that, I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. Hung up the phone and I just cried. Oh my God. I, I ran to my husband. I just started crying. And then that, that night when I went to sleep, not a single nightmare. Wow. I haven't had one since. So it's really has been just the culmination of all of that. <laughs> Wow. I, I love what you said about getting your healing, part of your healing through writing. A lot of people do that. They write their story and they feel better. They feel lighter because now it's out of you. So you took it a step further where you actually went, made the phone call and got it out of you. Because you would think that forgiveness is about the other person. No, it's about freeing yourself up so that you can go thrive and live your life. So mm -hmm. having the courage to face that, face the trauma, whatever's been holding you back, that is that is courageous. That is a lot of strength. A lot of people are just not able to do it. And so I, I want to encourage everyone today, like you might not be at the level where you can go face your tormentor, let's call it that, and really just free yourself, speak your truth, be your authentic self and get that out of you. But maybe mm -hmm. writing a book might be a way for you to tell your story and really get that healing because you do need to heal to be able to move forward in life and create, create the things that he desires. Like life is too short. You know, there's so, there's so much 
it, good things out there. We don't want to be holding on to the past and let it that weigh you down. And sometimes yeah. you can't control it. So you're having nightmares every day. There's nothing, there's nothing you can do about it. Like you didn't create this, you didn't cause it, but now it's happening to you every single day. So if you can free yourself up through writing a book, go write that book. <laughs> You know, I mean, it really is that simple, isn't it? And I know like, you know, when I tell people my story, they're like, wow, that's powerful. And yeah, it is. Everybody's story. It's not mine. It's everybody's story is powerful. And so when somebody says, I don't know how to write, well, all you got to do is just write down the moments that happen. So the way I hop on the phone with my dad, I was like, this happened, that happened, this happened, that happened. That's all you have to do. You write that down. What happened? Because as you read back what happened, you remove yourself yes, and you start to separate the story of what happened, like how you felt about it and your emotions. Yeah. And you separate that from what actually happened, like the actual actions that took place. No emotion, no thinking about it, just the physical actions of what happened. Yeah. Once you can separate those two, you can look at the the words of what happened and say oh okay it happened but and like like what now you know it, it happened what, what do you want me to do about it it happened and that's that's it's very powerful to be able to do that and it doesn't take a lot of work all it takes is writing it down that's mm -hmm. it now if you choose to publish yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> okay so let, let's talk about it it doesn't take a lot of work but it takes a lot of strength and courage yes. so, like i said some people might everyone has a story and some people are just like oh i'm just gonna run oh, get out of me and so people might be feeling that you know that trepidation that fear because again a lot of it comes with what will people say how will people look at me are they going to look at me the same? Are they going to laugh at me? Are they going to mock me? Are they going to, uh, and then the voice, oh, and they're like, okay, let me just go hide. Like, go pretend. Yeah. Like, it's okay, but everything is not okay. What would you say to people who are scared to tell their story? I feel like, first and foremost, you need to tell it to yourself. I think a lot of that fear stems from, it's funny, I had this conversation with my mom. Of course, the fear comes from judgment, right? What are people going to say when I tell my story? But I think a part of that fear is because you've never said your story out loud before. Mm. You've never heard it. You've never seen it. It's just a video that's playing over and over in your head. Mm. So to take it from here and try to put it out there, it is frightening. So before you try to share your story with someone else, share your story with yourself. Okay. So either speak it, like you literally pick up your phone, record a voice note, this is what happened to me, and then play it back. Don't just say it. Say it first, record it, save it, and then listen to it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you choose to write it, do the same thing. Keep a journal. Keep it locked if you want to. But after you're done writing it, don't throw it away. You must go back and read it. Because once you get comfortable with seeing and hearing your story, it is then easier to go tell it. That's how it was for me. Like, oh my gosh, when I first hopped on, it was somebody's radio show. I don't remember whose, but it was somebody's radio show that I hopped on and they were like, so Portia, tell us your story. And I'm like, do I say everything that happened? Because if I tell them that I'm in Nigeria, they're going to say, why? Well, how did you get there? Well, what was life like before you went? You know, there's so many questions. And if you bite your tongue, it leaves <laughs> all of these unanswered questions. And then your story doesn't make sense. You have to be truthful and you have to be honest, but you have to know the truth within yourself first. So before I did the radio show, I ended up biting my tongue. I listened back to it. I was like, oh, this girl, she sounds a hot mess. She <laughs> is running around in circles <laughs> with her language and using all weird words. And it's just, you know, I, you can't follow my story. Oh my gosh, I wish I could. I, I don't remember what it was, but you can't follow my story. So if you watch that and you're going to be like, I have no idea who this woman is. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, okay. <laughs> Um, she okay? so after that I just sat down with my husband and I was like let's just talk and all we did was just talk about what happened I was able to reminisce and like oh man yeah these things really did happen and then luckily I had my sister so I hopped on the phone with my sister and we just started talking about the things that actually happened mm 
Mm -hmm. And I was like, see, now I know my story. Like now I know what really happened, getting it out, talking it out. So then when I did my next podcast or, you know, I was a a guest, excuse me, a guest on another podcast, I was free, baby. I was, let me, I just, I'm going to tell my story. I don't care. I don't care. I know my dad's probably going to hear it. He's probably going to be pissed. I don't care. It's my story, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, share it with yourself first. Now, me, I had my husband and my sister. Hmm. But if you have somebody close to you who's not going to judge you, share it with them. Just talk about it. Don't make it a big old project. It's not homework. Just talk. Yeah. And you'll get comfortable. Yeah, I, I I like that. Share with yourself first. And then if you have people that you trust who are not going to judge you, share with them. And then you'll Thanks. be free to share it with the world because the world is waiting for that story. Okay, so for those who have decided to move forward and maybe publish your book, I know all the excuses I've heard. Oh, I don't have time. Oh, I need a publisher. Oh, no one's going to publish your book. Yada, 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 yada. What is the difference between traditional publishing and self-publishing? Because the publishing world has changed in the last couple of years. So what's the major difference for you? Oh, my favorite question. <laughs> um, so I never like to, well, I want to stop using the term self-publishing and start using the term independent publishing because self-publishing has a very bad connotation nowadays, right? So let's just say the difference between traditional and independent. So traditional is your typical publishing house like Penguin, Random House, Simon & Schuster. These are publishing companies that pick up your manuscript and say, oh, this is awesome. We're going to publish it. So we'll create your cover. We will do the formatting. We will do the illustrations if it needs it, and we will release it. And we're going to give you anywhere between 8 and 15% royalty on each person. <laughs> but we might give you an advance. So you're going to get a nice chunk of money right off the gate. Okay. So that's traditional publishing. That's what we used to do. Like, you know, back in the day, that's what was happening. Still happening now, but that's all we did. Yeah. Independent publishing means that you are responsible for everything. So nobody's picking up your manuscript. So you have your manuscript, but you got to make sure the cover's done. You have to make sure it's formatted and you have to choose where to publish. For example, are you going to upload it online to KDP or Ingram Spark? These are print on demand uh, companies. Or are you going to put it on your website and sell it that way? But it is all on you to figure that out. And okay. you have to pay out of pocket. It's an investment. The good thing about it is any and all book sales, 100% of that royalty is yours. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to, I mean, unless you go with like <laughs> the print on demand, you know, you got to, they're, they're going to take some of your money each time they print and ship, but. But it's nothing compared to the publishing houses that just rip you off and take like 85% of all your hard work. So are there some people who are better suited for the independent authoring or traditional, or should everyone just go the independent authoring path? Okay, great question. So no, everybody should not do independent. You, there are some people that are better suited for traditional and some that are better suited for independent. So the folks that are going to go with traditional, they're usually the type of folks that don't really care about having creative control and they really don't want to invest. Like they're like, I don't have the money. I just have a good story and I want to give it to somebody and do something amazing with it. Mm -hmm. So that's those folks. But the self-publishing people are the people that they're in love with their book. And they want to design their cover and they don't want it to be edited like crazy. And then it doesn't even sound like them anymore. You know, (laughs) those people that are a little bit more controlling about the creativity inside the book are probably going to go with self-publishing. Those individuals, excuse me, independent publishing, (laughs) those individuals who love that and have the passion for that are more than likely willing to invest the money to get it done. Now, I've come across writers who were like bleeding heart artists, you know, they're like, oh, I love it. This is my baby. And they're a starving artist. And so they're like, how much is it going to cost to get this done? Oh, never mind. Let me just, <laughs> let me get rid of it. You know, there are those individuals, but uh, really it, it comes down to control and the ability to invest. Mm-hmm. If you have the money and you want control, independent. If you don't have the money and you don't care about control, 
traditional. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I know you're talking, and so I get that. Um, so control is a big factor because, again, like you're saying, with the traditional, they can change the entire manuscript, and it sounds they can even change the title. They can change anything, and then mm -hmm. it no longer sounds like you. But they also come with a lot of experience, especially when it comes to marketing the book, doing book tours, getting signing, getting endorsements, getting all that great stuff that a lot of authors, starving authors, <laughs> suffer from. So how can people, independent authors, benefit or get those things? Because a lot, I hear it a lot of times. Oh, I, I don't know how to market it. I know people who have written so many books and the books are just sitting in their homes. They haven't sold a single copy because they never thought about what else. Yes, you've written the book. Now what? You don't have a publisher to take on all of the marketing and you have to do it yourself. So what are some of the things that people need to be aware of before they decide to become an independent author? So, okay, let's let's talk about the marketing aspect because that's very important, right? The funny thing is traditional publishers nowadays rarely market for their authors anymore. Unless you're huge, like unless they pick up your, your manuscript and they know this is like amazing, this is going to be the next Netflix film, then they'll do the marketing. But if you're just, you know, an average person, rarely do they do marketing for you anymore. So either way, you're going to have to hustle yourself. Now, <laughs> with independent publishers, I, I get what you're saying. Like, I went through all this work. I did it. The cover is done. Everything. The book is done. I have it in my house. What do I do? How do I sell it? There are publishing companies out there that are willing to help you. Mystique Rose is one of them. So what we have is publishing services, everything you need to be the author that you want to become. You mean You get what I mean? And so like, so we have marketing services. So it's a monthly subscription and we're going to take care of the four pillars of marketing. So we have branding, social media management, email marketing, and influencer marketing. There are so many companies out there that can do that for you. You just got to pick through, really interview them, you know, make sure they vibe with what you are putting out, you know, all that stuff. Make sure they're on the same level as you and go ahead, sign with them. But the only thing is marketing is no joke. Somebody who does it and does it right will charge you. So like we have competitive prices. So we tend to, we try to stay on the lower side just because there are so many indie authors out there that already put thousands into their books. Okay. So it's like, we don't need you putting like 5,000 into marketing, but that's what people charge. Like if you want the public relations and you want the social media management and the influencer marketing, you should be looking at five to six thousand dollars every month for marketing. Every month. Yeah, not even yearly. Like, every month. like just Google that. I really want people to Google that. Google marketing services, full marketing services. That is uh, so. Um, I mean, listeners, don't get scared yet. No, no, there's good news coming. <laughs> well, the good news. The good news about it is that there Udemy is such a huge thing, right? Like you, you have what is the other ones? I don't know. All these online courses. You go to YouTube University. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes, yeah. you can learn how to do things yourself. So I would always say start with branding before you do anything else. You must brand. I think the mistake that most authors make is that they don't treat it like a business. That is true. Publishing a book is a business. If you don't treat it as such, you will lose. Plain and simple. Like, period. That's it. it if is you're gonna you're gonna spend money either way. Either it's formatting or edit, you're you're gonna spend money. So you need to recoup some of that money. Because some people are like, oh, I'm just writing just to free myself. I don't care about the money. Well, you're gonna spend money. You're gonna spend thousands of dollars to get a good book out there. So if there's a way to recoup some of that, keep listening. Yes. So like, and when I say treat it like a business, I don't mean just invest because yes, you're going to invest every single month to get this book off the ground, right? Because publishing is one thing, but actually there's this clubhouse room that I go into and the woman, her name is Renata. She titles it. You gave birth to your book. Now you have to raise it. Yep. Love it. <laughs> You have to, because like, hey, it's out there. Making a baby is fun. We can all agree. Good times. But what do you do when you've given birth? Mm -hmm. You 
can't just run around and be like, oh, what am I going to do? You have to prepare. And authors don't do that. And that's why their books fail. So start with branding. It is a business, not just the money that you put in, but the actual aspect of any business always centers around branding. I'm not talking about logos and colors. That's fun. You can do that. But I'm talking about your value. What do you stand for? What would you like to represent? What do you want to be remembered for? Yeah. All of that goes into your branding. Once you have your branding, then you can go out on social media and show up the way you want to show up. Use the language that you want to use. Mm -hmm. And people will start to take notice. Mm -hmm. Then you have things like, okay, let's do Facebook ads. Let's do book promos. Let's reach out to influencers. Let's do this blog post. Let's get my website done. You know, you can slowly start to build. But if you're going to invest in anything right out the gate, assuming your book is already published, <laughs> Uh, or actually, no, you really should be starting before the book is published. But I'm speaking specifically to those who have published. Invest money into branding. Get somebody to do your branding for you. Hmm. That's very important. So find a, a branding expert and say, hey, I got a book. It's out. I am now an authorpreneur. And I need oh to... Love it. An <laughs> authorpreneur. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> 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 okay so you mentioned get a website you know build your brand so once you have your brand figured out you know what your values are what you stand for how you want to show up to the world what message you want to share with the world great and then you mentioned you know have a website how important is it to have a website not really important um because I think for you could have a landing page like it doesn't have to be a whole website some presence some presence some online presence yes. Okay. Some online presence and social media is not enough because social media is very distracting. People scroll for hours. They will come across your post. Oh, that looks amazing. Swipe. They don't care. Okay. You know, <laughs> they're gone. <laughs> they, 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 they <laughs> okay. Exactly. So social media presence, not enough, but have it as well because people need to be able to find you. Have some mm -hmm. uh, online presence. Could be a landing page, could be a website where people can at least find you find your book and have a way to buy your book and then you also mentioned uh some people might just want to do the the kdp so that's uh, amazon people want to sell on mm -hmm. amazon what else can they do because now it, we're talking about we have a book we've published a book or we're about to publish a book what are the things that we should be thinking about to get our book off the ground yeah so you really want to start to understand your market and i think that's the most important thing understanding who your audience is who did you write your book for Unfortunately, too many times does somebody write a book for themselves? Because yeah. terrible idea. <laughs> it's terrible. For myself. <laughs> <laughs> no. Never write a book for yourself because nobody else is going to want to read it but you. <laughs> oh my God. I said that to someone recently and she she didn't find it funny. I said, no one cares about your story. They care about what your story, how your story can help them. Because it's just writing about you, 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 you. Okay. And so what? What's that got to do with me? <laughs> Exactly. Like, why would I care? So you need to understand your audience. Who did you write your book for? Once you figure out who you wrote your book for, you need to understand that person and then go out on social media and find them, which is my favorite thing to do. So it's like, okay, let's say I, let's say I have a crime fiction. Right? <laughs> the one that's yet to be published, but that's okay. The one that's yet to be published. The mysterious <laughs> crime fiction by Portia Bastille. Hey, y'all, y'all about secrets. The secret book by Portia. <laughs> so let's say I have that, right? And I find out that this book is perfect for teen males mm. uh, living in the U.S. that come from low-income families. Very specific. You need to get as specific as possible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a persona. I'm going to create this person in my head. His name is going to be Brian. And he's a senior in high school. He's about to graduate. He's about to go to college. He's stressed, man. He can't afford it. So he just spends his time reading these books. He loves crime fiction. He watches true crime on TV, law and order all day, every day. That's what this guy loves. So where, where does this guy go to get this stuff? Oh, he's on Facebook all the time. Mm -hmm. He loves scrolling through Instagram guess what? I need to now go out and find Brian on Facebook and Instagram. So I'm hopping into crime thriller groups, psychological thriller groups on Facebook, these different groups. And just watch, watch what people post. 
What books are they into? What are they reading? If you want to interact, you can ask a question. Guys, if I released a book that was about blah, 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 would you buy it? And people will be like, oh my God, yes, that sounds awesome. That sounds awesome. You know, people will start commenting yeah. and there you go. Now you just got interest. Yeah. You're like, okay, guys, listen, thank you so much. I'm working on it, but do me a favor. Do you want to sign up to my email list? I mean, you might not have one yet, but let's get one. Do you want to <laughs> sign up to my email list? And, you know, I'll email you once the book is out. I'm like, sure. I'm like, okay. Now, if you had a landing page that was connected to an email like MailChimp or something, very simple. Keep it free. You know, just get the free MailChimp account, you know, get a it's cheap like landing page. Private, people find it private at email addresses and MailChimp. Or free. That's good. Mm -hmm. yeah. So create the landing page inside MailChimp. It's free. Mm -hmm. Send in that link. They can go put in their email. Boom. You got them. Wow! You instantly created an audience before your book is even written. I I know, and I th I think that is so profound because a lot of people get stuck. Oh, I'm having writer's block. I'm you know I can't think of. Oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know what the same. They can't write the story, but they they just stuck. But I love what you're saying. Once you know who your audience is and you know where to find them, you can start engaging them before you've even written the book, because now at least you have the validation that a lot of people need to be yes. able. To <laughs> because if you're going to your family they know your target only to say, what do you think about this they're like mm, i wouldn't read it you're like oh yeah maybe i'm not oh. gonna read well. <laughs> go to your right target audience go there and ask them would you read this and i love that you're saying start building your email list start building your following even before you've written the book so that when you write the book then it's easier you're not like oh you just have it in your in your closet at home and you're like no one buys my book yeah of course no one buys your book nobody knows about your book Exactly. But, but it does sound easy the way you're describing it. And I know it's not easy for a lot of people because some people just want to write the book and just be done with it. And that's where your service is coming to. Into. Exactly. If you're struggling, maybe you've written a couple of books. Hey, I'm going to be honest. I know people who have written 10 books and haven't sold one copy. If you've written books or you're writing a book, then help is here. And it doesn't have to be as expensive as the $5,000 a month services. The, the, here you have a company that can work with you to identify some of the things we're talking about, you know, who's your book for, who's your, what are your values, who's your target audience, and then now start promoting your book in a way that it's still authentic to who you are, exactly. and it can really get those, the real, your customers, the people who want to consume whatever you've written in your book. So I, exactly. I, I think I think that's really phenomenal, and I think that a lot of people, if you have a book at home, you haven't sold a copy, I'm going to put... <laughs> Her website in the show notes, click on it, <laughs> send an email, get started because the world wants to hear your story. They want to see, but they're not going to know about it if they don't even know you exist or even know where to find it. Exactly. And, you know, we do help any and everybody, you know, if, wow. if you need that help, reach out to me, I'm going to help you. But I specify in helping coaches. And the reason for that, I had to pivot. So when I first started Mystique Rose, we were really just bringing everybody in. Come on. Anybody and everybody who has a book. And then I noticed I, I needed to create more impact. You know, I just don't, I don't, I don't necessarily want to work with a starving artist because those people are not, they're not serious. They're not going to invest. I don't have money. Money. <laughs> yes, they don't want to invest. And it's like, listen, me and my team, we put in the time, the passion, and I put my all into the books that I work on. So if you are not going to invest in me, I'm not going to invest in you. So we found out that um, coaches have the ability to truly impact the world. So you're out, you're doing your online course, you're talking to people, you're you're transforming lives, but you yourself, your story's not out there. Hmm. Now, the, the level of impact that you have is declined simply because you don't have a published book. But when you have a published book, you step into thought leadership. And you become the go-to expert and you start to build your legacy as a coach. So for, for coaches who have published their books already, congratulations. Hey. Let's talk. Yeah. <laughs> Let's help you market it. But for coaches who are listening, who haven't published their books, we need to do that. That, that really is the next step for any seasoned coach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good audience to target because I am yet to come across a coach who doesn't have a story they have oh my god <laughs> and that's why they're so transformational because they have 
stories, like st- scary stories. Yes. Fire. And I love what you said because it is true. People don't know their story. And until people know your story, they know why you do what you do. It's harder for people to resonate and really be like, she went through what I went through. I can trust her as a coach. I can trust her to guide me. But if you're just selling great content, great stuff, you got a course, you got a this, okay, good. I might still trust you. But when you share your story, that is powerful. Yes. Like it gives you a deeper understanding. I think that's what it is. It's like, like, okay, how I shared my story now. Like if I just came on and we just started talking about book publishing, it's like, oh, wow great you know Portia knows what she's talking about clearly okay she's an independent publishing expert I get that she gave me great information thank you but I started with my story and that story drives why I do what I do because what got me through those days those low days was reading other people's stories what they've been through how they overcame and those stories were impactful to me and so as that's why I do what I do. And I have to tell that story in order for people to understand and, and grasp it. So for coaches, it's like, listen, you wouldn't be a coach if you didn't go through the fire. No, <laughs> no, I haven't yet to be one yet. No, I haven't met any. Every single I mean, because how do you become an expert? How do you become credible on what you teach if you yourself didn't pass through whatever it is yeah. that's happening? Yeah, you know, I agree. I I agree. Tell your story. Now is the time. No more excuses. No more. I'm not a writer. You don't have to be a professional writer to write a book. Not all. <laughs> I'm definitely not a writer, but hey, I have a I have an award winning book, so it it's possible. You can do it. There is help available. No more excuses. Now is the time to write that book that the world has been waiting for. So. <laughs> So how do you work with your clients? If someone is thinking now, okay, I've been on the fence and I'm still not sure I don't know if it's for me. How do you work with them? What are your programs like? Is it a one-on-one? Is it a group coaching program? And who? I know you're saying coaches, but is it all types of coaches? Yes, it's all coaches. So anybody who is a certified coach, Mm -hmm. yes, we work with them. And then, so what we have is a program. So this is a 60-day program. And you work with me one-on-one for the entire 60 days. And what I'm doing is helping you to extract your story and transform your messaging and combine it with your story to create that book. So we're working together for the first 30 days. And as we're going back and forth, I'm also training you on how to become an author because you're a coach, but you have to learn how to be an author. And so after the first 30 days, the manuscript is written and you're still going through the transformation process. My team then starts to produce the book so that you don't have to go find anyone else. So we're coaching, we're training, the manuscript is done. And now the rest of my team, they're putting that book together, working on it, working on it, submitting it to you for approval, the cover, the interior design, the editing, all of it is being sent to you for approval. And so by the end of that 60 days, you know how to be an author you know what steps to take and your book is produced and published. Wow, that is a one-stop shop for all things authoring. (laughs) 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 Honestly, and like no more excuses. Like you're helping, you're teaching people how to write, how to author, how to become an author, how to write a book, the right language, the right whatever, creating the right story, drawing out this story. Cause I, yeah, I know how painful that I went through that. It's very painful because you might have snippets of your story, but you don't know how it all comes together, how it culminates to have that hero journey, because that's what people want to see your story of overcoming and how that impacted your life and how we can impact or change theirs. So you're teaching people how to do that. You're helping them to kind of construct the book, put everything together, make sure it looks good, work on the cover, work on the formatting, work, and then you deliver a fully, pu- a fully, <laughs> Published book, yeah, pretty much. But we take them through the publishing process as well. So like, it'll be live and ready for purchase by the end of the program. But you know, some authors, they already have the manuscript. So it's not like we don't work with people who have the manuscript already. Mm -hmm. If you have a manuscript, that's perfect still come through you're still going to be put through the same program and we're going to be looking over that manuscript and making sure that it's okay and that you're happy with it Mm -hmm. and still you're still going to go through that transformation you must become an author you must understand what it is to be an authorpreneur and then we continue 
Wow, amazing. So for everyone, regardless of where you are in the journey, there is a service for you here. No more excuses. I think that's the goal for today. No more excuses. It's time to okay. write that book. It is time to write that book. It is work, but it's not a lot of work. And now at least you have someone who's been there, who's helped hundreds of people achieve exactly the same thing. to so hold your hand to guide you on the process along the journey to get your final published book. Oh, I wish I met you before I published my book. <laughs> <laughs> my book's two years old now. So I'm thinking, okay, it's time for another book. <laughs> hey. well, we'll, we'll be talking about my next book. That's for sure. We will be. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I'm going to have to ask though, moving to Nigeria, what is one of the most, one of the things that surprised you the most? Besides how tall my husband was. <laughs> how tall is he? He never measured. He's like six two, but it's not that tall. But from pit, you know, I only saw him online. So yeah. from pictures, I'm thinking, oh, he's like five ten, five eleven. I met him in person. The guy's like, yeah, I'm I'm five four. So oh, he's like, because <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah, five eleven. I'm, 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 I'm like six two. Yeah, big deal. <laughs> oh yeah, for you and me, who's short, I'm like this guy is massive. <laughs> um. Ooh, what is like culture shock? Culture shock, yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is a good one. I think, um, okay, I have a couple. I have a couple. I have a couple. So one was the inconsistency in electricity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have to have your own personal power supply here. Yeah. <laughs> yes i mean we have electricity but you know neighbor i don't know it goes up, yeah yeah it goes off you gotta go it goes off yeah like it goes off i'm in a bad mood turn it off yeah the whole thing <laughs> exactly <laughs> but i think it also is the area that i'm in so it's not like all of nigeria like if you go up north they have constant electricity but, you know the government is corrupt and they favor the north so there's constant electricity up north and the rest of us in the east and the south, we're just, ah, screw them. You know, they don't care about us. Yeah. So, you know, um, so that was, it wasn't problematic. It just, because I already knew, I, I remember seeing it in video when I would like video chat with my husband and like, I would see the power would just go out. So I knew, <laughs> but it was different than actually like living in it. I was like, oh, that sucks. Um, Another thing, culture shock. The, the the funny thing was that I came here and I just saw that I look Nigerian. You that was crazy to me. <laughs> <laughs> you look like you could be my sister. Hello. <laughs> you fit right in. <laughs> so like I would walk down the street and people don't say anything. They think I'm Nigerian. And then I start speaking. And they're like, who is this one? <laughs> who, is, who is this one? Like, um, I'm not Nigerian and like you have Nigerian in your family not that I know of I mean my great 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 grandparents weren't Nigerian as far as I know you know so that was interesting and it's so funny for me the, the biggest thing was their idea of what black Americans are like yeah so <laughs> it was a mess so what they know about us is what they see in music and television and that's a terrible representation of us. Mm -hmm. So when I came and I would say things like, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. I was being polite. They said, ah, this one, this this Black American, she, she, she so, wait, Thursday, she get respect. She get respect. <laughs> yeah, because I, I was raised that way, you know. And they were so shocked to find out that we were physically disciplined growing up. And I'm like, well, most Black Americans are. You, you, you get beat if you don't behave. And they're like, man, you know, I thought, but in, it, it was, a, it was very weird to be called white. Oh. That was very strange. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because what? So here, any foreigner is a white person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any foreigner. Mm -hmm. So they say, like they say, oh, see this white woman. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I'm looking around like. Not me. <laughs> you know? and, and so it was it was very interesting. And and to see 
racism unfolds back home while I'm here. Hmm. That took some doing. It took some doing to get used to, to, to be here and not have to worry about certain things. And, and I would speak to people back home and they were like, oh, you, you know, live in huts and you have TV. And they were so surprised. I took a picture at Domino's and they were like, there's a Domino's in Nigeria. I'm like, listen, you guys need to learn a thing or two. So like, I do my best to yeah, teach. Google the Domino's. <laughs> terrible though isn't it and and but it's terrible both ways yes. what americans think about nigerians is based on what we see on television which is the poor representation yeah. and what they think about americans is terrible because of what they see on television which is a poor representation yeah. so that that was huge for me <laughs> i'm still trying to learn Igbo. my husband is Igbo. <laughs> trust me i've been Igbo for 43 years and i still don't speak it so you're good <laughs> Oh, that makes me so happy because I feel so happy. <laughs> yeah, that's oh, cool. And I still don't speak Igbo, so yeah, you're good. Oh, good. Okay, I'm trying. My husband will say some stuff, and I'm like, <laughs> you know, but his English, you know, he, he his English Igbo is his native tongue, but English, he even thinks in English, you know, so it's not like it's not a problem. But when we go back to the village and the people are looking at me, Portia, do you know Igbo yet? And then they'll start speaking to me, and I'm like, no, I don't know. I they, they say, Take one. I'm like, I did my, like, I, I know, like, you know, small stuff. <laughs> my pigeon is better than my Igbo. Trust me. <laughs> wow, you're doing well. That's awesome. How many years have you been in Nigeria now? Almost three. I wow. came in 2019, at the oh. end of 2019. Oh, that's awesome. Well, <laughs> thank you so much. So anyone who's thinking about moving to Nigeria, that's okay. You can go. Yeah, partial surviving and thriving. So <laughs> it's not all bad. Don't believe what you see in the news. Yes. Just be careful. Every country has its problems. Absolutely. I say the same thing about Nigerians who want to go to America. I'm like, are you sure? <laughs> I don't think you want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here with us. Super amazing. And I really hope that, you know, you've inspired a lot of people to tell their stories, especially coaches. Share your story with the world. It doesn't have to be difficult. Posh is here to hold your hand and make sure that you get your authentic book published and in the hands of all the people that should read your book so that they can transform their lives too. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you to all of my amazing listeners. I hope to hear about your books. <laughs> so hit me up. <laughs> I will see you same time next week on iRise Conversations with Joan. Thanks for listening.